A team at the Carnegie Institution of Science has recently made a discovery around Saturn. They were able to detect 20 new moons around the ringed planet. So in this video, we're going to talk about some of those moons, what makes them unique, how they are able to discover them, as well as how you might be able to name some of these moons. So let's talk about that. This discovery announced 20 new moons around the planet Saturn, raising the total moon count to 82, which is three more than how many Jupiter has, making Saturn now the record holder for the planet with the most number of moons. Now it's really interesting because these moons were actually discovered using a ground-based telescope, this telescope being the Subaru telescope in Hawaii. Now the primary mirror for this telescope is 8.2 meters in diameter, or essentially a little bit taller than if a giraffe were to lie down on top of it. Now interestingly enough, the Subaru telescope is an infrared optical telescope, meaning that most of the wavelengths that it actually receives are wavelengths that we would be able to see with our own eyes. However, since it's a massive telescope, these moons are way too dim for us to see with the naked eye. Therefore, they need to use state-of-the-art technology to be able to determine where exactly these moons are around Saturn. Now you may be wondering, we've sent multiple missions to Saturn, for example, the most recent one being Cassini. So how was this spacecraft that was literally orbiting around Saturn not able to detect these new moons? And that's an excellent question. The reason is because some of the most notorious moons around Saturn, for example, Titan, is actually rather large. It has a diameter of around 5,000 kilometers, whereas the average size of these recently discovered moons is around 5 kilometers in diameter. Thus, larger moons like Titan are a thousand times larger in diameter and therefore reflect a lot more light to us here on Earth, making it easier to detect. Whereas, in order to find these much smaller objects that are far away, we need a lot more advanced telescopes. So even though these moons are relatively small, let's go ahead and discuss some of the interesting characteristics about them. It turns out, 17 of the 20 discovered moons actually orbit in something called a retrograde motion. Now, what does that mean? If we look at the planet Saturn from the North Pole, we can see that the planet as a whole actually rotates in a counterclockwise direction, or essentially the opposite direction that a clock goes. And typically, we would expect moons around Saturn to also orbit in that path. However, 17 of the 20 newly discovered moons, even though they are small, they actually orbit in a retrograde motion, meaning that they orbit clockwise rather than counterclockwise. Some more interesting characteristics about the retrograde moons are that they are also inclined with respect to Saturn having a relatively high inclination and are all relatively far away from the planet. Therefore, most of their orbits are relatively close to one another. And interestingly enough, these moons actually match a group of moons that already exist around Saturn, being called the Norse group. Therefore, these 17 moons fall within the Norse group as a whole. Now the other three moons all orbit in a prograde motion, two of which are in another group called the Inuit group, and the last of these recently discovered moons falls within the Gallic group. Now it's interesting because we discovered 20 new moons, and we can actually put them into categories that already existed with moons that were orbiting around Saturn. Why were we able to do this? Why were these new moons so close to the old ones that we knew about? And is there a benefit to even putting them into these groups? And the answer is, yes, there is a benefit. It turns out scientists believe that these moons or a lot of these combinations of smaller moons could have potentially have been one larger moon in the past. But let me explain. As of right now, there are 46 moons in the Norse category. So out of the 82 moons that are orbiting around Saturn, over half of them fall within this orbital category, meaning that they're all really close to one another. But why would this be so? It turns out that scientists believe at one point in the past, all of these moons could have been maybe one or two larger objects. And at some point, they could have collided with one another, essentially causing a massive explosion, throwing out debris in all different directions. This would essentially create a lot of smaller particles or moons orbiting around Saturn. 
So it's thought that these different classification or different moon groups essentially represent what could have been in the past one or two moons that eventually blew up or collided with one another, causing a lot of these smaller objects. Now observations like this are very fascinating because astronomers and scientists have to look at what exists right now in our solar system and try and theorize how that could have formed in the past, or essentially what happened throughout the history of our solar system to get to the remnants of what exists today. And this isn't unique to just Saturn. It turns out scientists also believe that Mars's two moons, Phobos and Deimos, could have also potentially been formed by a collision with Mars. Now the last example regarding collisions in the ancient solar system has to deal with one that happened here on Earth. In fact, scientists believe that in the early stages of our solar system, there was another planet called Theia, and Theia actually impacted Earth, causing the formation of our moon. Now if you want to learn more about this impact and the theories behind why this is so, let me know in the comments below and I'd be happy to make a video about it in the future. It's truly fascinating though, because through the discovery of these 20 new moons, scientists were able to categorize them directly into groups that already existed which essentially is just more evidence pointing towards the fact that they could have been larger moons in the past. Now, this raises an interesting question. I haven't mentioned a single name of these moons throughout this entire video, and the reason is because they haven't been named yet. In fact, Carnegie Science has actually opened up the naming of these moons to the public, meaning you can name one of Saturn's moons. And this deadline is up until December 6th of 2019. So if you're watching this video after December 6th of 2019, I apologize, you're too late. But for those of you that are watching it before that, right now you can suggest a new name for one of Saturn's moons. But there are a few rules. The first and biggest rule is the naming convention. If you decide to name any one of the moons, you have to name it after the mythology that it comes from. So for example, for the Norse group, or if you wanted to name a moon that is in the Norse group, you would have to give it a name that coincides with a giant in Norse mythology. And similarly, for the Inuit and Gallic groups, you would have to name them after giants in the Inuit and Gallic mythologies. So first of all, you could do some research into the mythology and see what names might work rather well. In addition, you also have to make sure that these names don't already exist in the solar system, which shouldn't be too hard, but I put links in the description below for you to double check if one of the names you come up with just so happens to be already existent. But essentially when you submit it, all you have to do is tweet at Saturn Lunacy with the hashtag name Saturn's moons. And you can include not only the name, but also pictures and videos that might further push the reason why you want to give it that name uniquely. But let me know in the comments below if you end up naming one of Saturn's moons or send a submission to name one of Saturn's moons because I'd love to hear what ideas you all come up with. But thank you for watching and I hope to see you in the next one.